what happens when a feminist punk icon steps away from the movement she helped ignite to create something even more daring? And how did one album, a mix of riotous electronic beats and sharp political commentary, help shape indie music at the turn of the century? Hi, I'm Andy Fenstermaker, host of Poetic Wax, a weekly music history series where I dig into the record collection I've been building since the 1990s to uncover the history of a band and album or song within. Today, we are diving into the story of La Tigre's explosive self-titled album, released October 25, 1999. A blend of DIY feminism, digital revolution, and dance punk that still hits hard more than 25 years later. To truly understand La Tigre, we, we need to start with its core members. Kathleen Hanna, Johanna Fateman, J.D. Sampson, and Sadie Benning. First, Kathleen Hanna. You probably know her best as the front woman of Bikini Kill and one of the pioneers of the Riot Girl movement, an underground feminist punk revolution from the early 1990s. She screamed for women's liberation and self-expression, becoming an icon of radical politics and DIY ethics. You may also know her from the story of how Nirvana's explosive track, Smells Like Teen Spirit, got its name. By the late 1990s, something had shifted. Hannah felt trapped by the Riot Girl movement. The media distorted its message, and she faced constant harassment and misunderstanding. In an interview, she explained her frustration. I was just exhausted from being a spokesperson for something. I wanted to make music and art and not constantly feel like I was failing at being a perfect feminist hero. In 1997, Hannah recorded a self-titled album under the moniker The Julie Ruin. Recorded entirely in her bedroom on a four-track recorder, this DIY project allowed Hannah to explore more experimental sounds, blending lo-fi with electronic beats, spoken word, and quirky samples. While The Julie Ruin was raw and personal, it was also thematically powerful, focusing on self-reflection, the complexities of identity, and perhaps most notably, personal autonomy. The album stood in stark contrast to the high-energy punk of Bikini Kill, offering Hannah a new way to channel her feminist message while testing the waters of electronic production. But it dealt with some highly personal experiences, things that she recounts in her book, Rebel Girl, where she talks about some of the discomfort she had with the project in its early days. Still, the Julie Ruin helped set the stage for what would become La Tigra. In many ways, it was a transition point. Hannah was still fiercely political, but now experimenting with playful electronic sounds and solo creative control. This project laid the groundwork for La Tigre's signature mix of DIY punk ethos and electronic instrumentation. The lo-fi beats and irreverent style that she developed during the Julie Ruin project would later evolve into more polished collaborative sounds when she teamed up with Johanna Fateman, J.D. Sampson, and Sadie Benning. Hannah still needed that fresh start, a new creative outlet, without the baggage the Riot Girl scene came with, where she could really just have more fun. And that's where La Tigre comes in. 1998. Enter Johanna Fateman, a multimedia artist and writer who had already collaborated with Hannah on previous zines. Fateman's unique perspective and background in experimental art brought a more structured, conceptual edge to La Tigre. With her, the band became as much about visuals, aesthetics, and multimedia as it was about music. The third founding member was Sadie Benning, a video artist and filmmaker known for their experimental DIY-style work. 
Benning, who joined the band in 1998, had gained attention in the early 90s for their black and white video diary films shot on a Fisher-Price Pixel Vision camera. Their visual artistry and unique approach to storytelling aligned perfectly with La Tigre's multimedia feminist approach. Though Benning left the band after their first album, their influence on the band's initial aesthetic and politically charged content was undeniable. Then there's J.D. Sampson, who would join La Tigre a bit later, but became a crucial part of their sound and political message. Samson, a genderqueer artist and musician, brought their distinct approach to performance art and identity politics. Together, the trio, and now four, quartet, embraced punk's DIY roots, but brought in a fresh blend of electronic music, sampling, political commentary, and visual arts. While J.D. Sampson wasn't a part of La Tigre's debut album recording, they played a crucial role during the band's early tours in support of the record. Initially joining as the band's projectionist and slideshow operator, Sampson added a powerful visual component to La Tigre's live performances, using projected imagery to enhance the band's messages. Sampson's involvement with the band grew, and they officially joined as a member in 2001, contributing to La Tigre's evolution, both musically and visually, in the years that followed. In The Punk Singer, Hannah talks about needing to get away. Just down the corridor, Portland seemed a likely ideal spot. It was here she connected with Fateman. The two hit it off instantly, eventually making their way to New York, where the band came together in 1998. What was originally going to be more of a multimedia performance of the Julie Ruin transformed to become La Tigra. The new direction was born from Hannah's desire to loosen up and blend political with playful. No longer confined to the Riot Girl ethos, she and Fateman wanted to experiment with electronic beats, sampling, and more danceable tunes, all while still maintaining a sharp satirical political edge. La Tigre allowed me to play, to experiment, to do something fresh. I didn't have to be angry all the time, states Kathleen Hanna. It wasn't just about rebellion anymore. It was about rethinking rebellion. What if political statements could come wrapped in electropop beats? What if you could dance and shout about injustice at the same time? In the earliest days, La Tigre existed as a multimedia project, incorporating video art, DIY performances, and zine culture. Their message was serious, but their music was full of color and irony. In 1999, La Tigre recorded their self-titled debut album, releasing it in October of that year. It was a raw, energetic blend of lo-fi electronics, punk, and feminist politics. The recording process wasn't exactly traditional. Working with minimal equipment, the band experimented in their homes using samplers and drum machines and Hannah's unmistakable vocals. I mean, listen to any track on this album and you can draw direct parallels to anything by Bikini Kill simply from Hannah's vocals themselves. The album was full of contrasts, catchy beats with biting commentary, riot girl, but not... We didn't have a fancy studio. We made this album with whatever we had, a sampler, a four track, a whole lot of ideas, and not a lot of money. And that was Johanna Fateman. Tracks like Decepticon became instant anthems. <laughs> Its chant-like vocals and driving beats urged it to get up and move, while the lyrics critiqued consumer culture and conformity. Then there's Hot Topic, a tribute to feminists, queer icons, and radical thinkers that influence the band. Decepticon is probably the most well-known track on the album. Its infectious energy paired perfectly with Hannah's sharp-tongued lyrics. The song took shots at corporate greed, sexism, fake rebellion, but with a beat you couldn't resist. And then there's the lyrics. Who took the bump from the bump -a lump -a lump Who took the ram from the ram-a-lama-ding-dong? 
It's a song that easily gets stuck in your head, but don't let those fun, sometimes silly lyrics fool you. It's a sharp social critique disguised as a dance hit. Once again, hot topic, a roll call for cultural and political heroes from Yoko Ono to Angela Davis, reminding us of the importance of intersectionality and community in activism. Latigra paid homage to the trailblazers who came before them. Latigra's debut album was a statement. It carved out space for a new type of feminist art that embraced irony, fun, and serious politics all at once. By combining Riot Girl roots with electronic beats and sometimes silly lyrics, as you heard, Latigra bridged genres and gave us a sound that felt both playful while also rebellious. After the release of La Tigra in 1999, the band released Feminist Sweepstakes in 2001 and This Island in 2004. Hannah ultimately stepped away from La Tigra after declining health, something she talks at length about in both The Punk Singer and in her book Rebel Girl. She was diagnosed with late-stage Lyme disease, likely stemming from a tick bite in 2005. In 2013, Hannah returned to music with Run Fast under the Julie Ruin moniker, which was followed by Hit Reset in 2016, the latter being released through sub-pop sister label Hardly Art. In 2023, La Tigra began touring again. So what's the legacy of La Tigra? For many, the band proved that politics and fun could actually kind of coexist in music. You didn't have to sacrifice humor and irony or melody to make a powerful statement. So what do you think? How did La Tigra manage to break free from the angry, serious tones of the Riot Girl era and still keep the spirit of rebellion alive? Did it succeed? And what does this album mean for feminist music today? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And while you're at it, like, subscribe, and share this with a friend. If you haven't yet, I strongly recommend picking up Hannah's book, Rebel Girl. I'll drop a link in the description to where you can find that. And then earlier in the 1990s, Hannah ran in circles of some pretty notable names in alt-rock. One of them, Kurt Cobain. In the next video, I go deep into the history of that song. You know it. Smells Like Teen Spirit, and Hannah's role in its creation.